Hey guys, welcome to the Tetra Health and Performance Podcast. Today, we're tackling the glutes and everything about the glutes. So, I want to give you a little bit of a spoiler. If you hang around long enough today, guys, we're going to talk to you and show you three of our favorite glute movements that build that booty up nice and big and make it as strong as hell. So stick around with us and um, listen out through the podcast and learn how to influence the glutes to perform to their highest capabilities. Today, you're joined with myself, Mitch, James, and Callan. We look forward to tackling the glutes. Where do we start, James? Um... Oh, first off, I think that the glutes, they are pretty the most praised, most uh, famous um, muscle in the body. They have, they have songs that have been written about them, mm. uh, multiple songs that have been written about them. Um, I'm sure they've had poems written so about them. So they mix a lot, baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and they are, they, they, they deserve it. They are the most powerful muscle in the body. Um, they are the densest muscle in the body. They are like right in the center of the body, so that the force that they can generate to, make, to create movement is, is massive. Um, there's a couple of famous quotes. There's a, a Louis Simmons, who, um, if you guys know West Side Barbell, very famous. It's like he even had a net Netflix documentary on him. And um, he has a quote saying, I have never seen a strong person with a small ass. And I think we can all attest to that. Like you see it in like Olympics, competitive games, like athletes, very often they have glutes, like noticeable glutes. Another um, a, a strength coach that we kind of admire, like Joe DeFranco, strength conditioning coach in America, um, and his, he says, uh, one of his sayings is, if I knew nothing about two individuals and had to place a bet on the w- a winner of a contest, I would bet for the guy with the bigger ass, which I think is fantastic, and it's something that's won me a lot of money. After. <laughs> <laughs> like when you're watching like an MMA fight and you don't know anything about the two and one guy has a bigger, bigger butt, then you... You could safely say that maybe he's going to be an extremely powerful athlete, maybe more powerful than the other. I love that you're hyper focused on their backside the whole time, James. Yep, Just watching two blokes' butts the whole way through the UFC that's fight. That's yeah, how you win. Gives them a nice <laughs> excuse to give it a watch, doesn't it? <laughs> that's how you win the money. <laughs> um, other other strength coaches that have um, popularized uh, glutes, like uh, Cal Dietz, who is a, um, a strength and conditioning coach in America, again, where he is um, trains with some, um, works with some of the best NFL teams, and he has moved it through in the NFL teams, and he's done very well with these NFL teams. Well, he has um, multiple ways of working with people to activate glutes and and feet for that because the feet and the glutes are tied in. And what he does with teams is pretty incredible. How he reduces injuries and um, builds strength and builds most importantly what most people want is performance from the glutes. Um, on top of that is there's there's coaches that have actually become famous by this one in particular called the glute guy so he has he's become famous he's made a living from talking about glutes and training glutes with um with multiple people and then his name is brett Contreras. he has a really tough career doesn't he <laughs> yes. he um works with victoria's secret models and he just works with glute work with them all day poor bot poor guy poor bot did you just say that? <laughs> poor <bastard>. <laughs> <laughs> um the glutes uh also, they get, they get a blame for um, various reasons, and they get the blame a lot. They get the blame for like low back issues, pelvic issues, um, sacroiliac joint issues, shoulder issues, hip issues, and pretty much I think at some point the glute gets the can, can and has got the blame for any issue or every issue in the body from somewhere. They, um, they get labeled quickly, right? They are quick to be labeled, and at Benchmark, we don't really love labels. We think one of the worst things about putting a label on something is people become that, and they start... Um, actually like emphasizing it even more so but they get labeled as a lazy like i think lots of us have probably heard the word like the sentence lazy glutes uh sleepy glutes inactive yeah glute amnesia is one uh weak glutes and short or weakened or tight glutes are all like numerous different things that they get and they get labeled and it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy right like if, if if a health practitioner says that to you like oh i'm sorry dude and I'm diagnosing you with weak glutes. And like, oh shit, oh no. And then suddenly like you're in the gym and you're spending 15, 20 minutes doing these band of drills to try and get that booty activated before the session, which we'll get into more about why that is a bit of a fallacy. And it becomes like this habitual thing and you become like this self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, I've got weak glutes. I need help. Yeah, that just Teach me how to get stronger yeah. glutes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, which is well, so it, unfortunate. It becomes in your head, you're, like, you feel fragile, you feel weak. And at the same time, you feel like you can you do end up blaming that for everything when there could be better reasons and better ways of organizing yourself to, to reach your results or goals. Um, on top of that, the glutes, when we say the glutes, there are actually three different glutes, glute muscles. We have the, the most famous of them all, the glute max, which is uh, gluteus maximus, which I think is, that's an incredible name, isn't it? We have the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus. Um, I think most of what we'll talk about today will be about the gluteus maximus because 
that's the powerhouse. That's, that's, that's the big boy. That's the one that uh, does all the impressive things and also the one that fills up your butt for aesthetics. That's the one that gets the insta likes. That's the one that matters. That's, that's yeah. the one that gets the insta likes. Mm-hmm. No, not many people have made famous Instagram profiles by having the biggest gluteus minimus. <laughs> what the hell was um, Russell Crowe's name in Gladiator? Like you said gluteus maximus. I'm thinking of like <laughs> Russell Crowe in Gladiator. <laughs> A Marcus Aurelius. Marcus that's right. That's yeah. it. That's Marcus, it. Marcus Maximus. My really? Really? Oh, it's it? pretty close. Man. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I yeah. bet he had big glutes in that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then with with the glutes, we just quickly we we'll talk about their kind of roles in um, in the things that we do day to day, right? Obviously, um, in walking um, and in and in running. Well, in um, walking, the glute max doesn't have a massive. Um, use it stabilizes the, the pelvis with the sacrum so in the middle of the pelvis it works as a, as a stabilizer also just works to kind of like slightly turn the pelvis a little bit as well and it works to like stabilize we call it something called force closure and then we have the medius and the minimus which their role is very much to keep the pelvis and the leg controlled and balanced as we move then when we're running like the gluteus minimus and maximus they still have the same kind of role right but they're going to have to work harder but now we're going to be talking about like the glute maximus really comes into play when we're running and then even more so and just gets bigger and bigger and works harder and harder as we actually move faster. The, um, there's a, a connection through the whole body, right? Like the, no muscle is independent of itself, right? Every, all muscles work together. Actually, muscles are a man-made construct. We kind of like, we've kind of broken down the body to make it simpler to understand and learn. When nearly everything is interconnected, but when it comes to the glutes and the connections, there's a chain called the posterior oblique chain. And that chain is how the butt coordinates through the thoracic lumbar fascia up and into the opposite lat. And we see this when we run. You see that kind of twist through the body. And that's a, priori- that's a big priority of what the glute's doing and how it works with the lat. And um, on top of that, we have the actual coordination of fi- like the, fi- the firing patterns, the neurological process of training the glutes and there's like a, a special uh, pattern that should happen most of the time where the glutes should actually fire first. Then what should happen is the, ha- the same side hamstring should fire second and then the opposite side QL should fire third. And this is something that we might touch on a little bit more in a bit where this is actually something that becomes very dysfunctional and people can't fire their glutes first. They end up either firing their hamstrings first or they fire up their, um, their Q- QL first. And this is something that we actually really want to try and train back into people, whether it's for function or whether it's just to increase the size of your butt where it's to stop the hypertonicity of your low back or even the hypertonicity of your hamstrings we find so many people we do exercises with in the gym where they're doing like a deadlift or like odd like deadlift is a really good example of this exercise or squats where they actually don't feel their butt much at all um, sometimes they don't even feel their hamstrings and sometimes it just feels like for them it's all back and i think we can attest to how many people you guys have trained that you can, you've, you've heard people say that, oh, I just fit in my back. Mm. Yeah, 100%. Like we, we do these Saturday sessions where we're all about trying to find those glutes, getting people to use their glutes. And I can't tell you how many times I've just been trying to stress them, oh, bend your knees more, hinge of the hips more. And just no matter what you do, they just can't seem to find that glute. And I think that's what you're talking about. Some people have that hypertonicity, but there is always a way through training that we can get those people back into our glutes. We're going to touch on that later as well. Yeah, and good exercise selection when it comes to that is just like organising people to be able to put the stretch into the bar then contract into the, um, more into the hamstrings, then contract more into the, the QL. When lots of gym exercise in the gym won't even get that QL engaged because it's not like we are actually sprinting forward or explosively forward. We're normally kind of stopping dead at the top with uh, most of the exercises we do in the gym. Um, on top of that, just a couple of things. Like when you look at the textbook of the, um, when you look at the explanation of a, of a glue or of, of a bum in textbooks, it's always, um, it's always just this one, 1D view well we've always got to remember that glutes and muscles they they don't just sit um flat on us they wrap around things like the glutes attach to the outside of our our femurs our legs and then they come all the way around into the back of the butt into the sacrum so they have a real big ability to use the pelvis as a fulcrum to explode and like a big stretch so the big stretch can then be a nice big contraction that pelvis too, man, that's a moving structure. Like, don't forget that thing. The thing it's wrapped to and inserted into, that thing alternates. It moves. It's got so much goddamn movement ability to it. So given it like this, like, one-dimensional movement pattern is, is kind of a false way to look at it. It has a 360-degree movement pattern that it has potential to move in. And trying to, like, the glutes are a big 
portion of unlocking how much movement that pelvis can do. Yeah, and like we as humans are reciprocal alternating humans. Like we, we, when we move, we alternate. We move one hip forward, the other hip moves back, and then we swing through. And that's with nearly every natural human movement that exists. And if we're looking at the glutes, well, one glute, when it puts shortening into the glute, the other glute should naturally be lengthening on the other side. And that's how we create power and the ability to like store energy to then create more power over time. So when we're looking at glutes, this is a, um, a big reason for why you don't just want to do bilateral exercises. Like we call them bilateral symmetrical exercises, which are exercises where you're just going to have this stance. You think of it like just like your, your typical deadlift, your typical squat where you're going to have feet side by side. Well, while they may be very good for contracting a lot of glute because you can overload them, you can put a ton of weight into them, well, they actually won't be able to hit certain aspects of the function of the glute and certain tissues of the glute that you'd want to um, you'd want to be to get if you want to train the whole glute. We've confessed to this in the in the past, but I'm a creep. I watch you. I watch how you walk. I think it's interesting. And like you talk about like firing patterns, like the the glute, the hammy, and the lower back. You know what, man? If that pelvis won't rotate and it won't be that um, alternating reciprocal reciprocal effort. You know what, we'll do it. The back, the back. Oh, okay, your pelvis don't want to rotate. I'll rotate for you. I'll be your mover. Dude, that ain't your job, but your body will find a way to do these movement patterns. So, like, if you want to join the creep club, you can watch someone walk and see if their pelvis actually moves left to right. Can they shift their weight? That's a pelvis, a booty that's doing their job, and it's, it's you know, that's kind of what we want to see. And when you can't get that happening, you start using other areas to kind of help out that pattern because your body's a beautiful system. It will get the job done regardless of what it has to use and prioritise. And I think you can see, and you can you can see when someone has this very natural gait pattern because it looks good. They look like people look light. They look like they can kind of just spring through the air, or they look light when they're walking. And then you can see the person who is a little bit stiffer through the um, the pelvis, and it's just moving with their low back because they look like they're walking like a fridge. Yeah, exactly. That, like it looks efficient, and that's what it's yeah. all about. That's what muscles are all about: is using the least amount of energy that I can to produce the desired movement. And then good glutes will do that. Yeah, and like two good examples is I think of. Uh, uh, Conor McGregor, like when he walks up on the stage <laughs> to fight someone, this is um, um, the like, noodle arms. Yeah, and how he kind of like he sw- like he over exaggerates gait, but you see everything moving and it's threatening. It's mm-hmm. like this guy can pounce, this guy can jump at me. And then on the other side of things, I think it's an, an evolutionary stand like point is that we look at people and we admire them when they kind of have this hip movement when they walk. And it's like you look at like a Victoria's Secret model walking down the um, catwalk and. They look like they, they're again, they're over exaggerating it, but they're over exaggerating something that we admire. Well, this person looks like they can move, yeah. right? They're moving through the hips, they can swing their hips, they can use their glutes, they can lo- use their pelvis. Only admiring their gait, nothing else. Yeah, <laughs> it's just the gait. Um, then, like, just a little bit more about the glutes um, is kind of like the divisions. Well, if we go, if we break them up first, we look at the glute max, because with what we're going to talk about today, this is probably the one that wants the most focus. We have three divisions of that glute max. So it's not just the glute max on its own. It never really is the case with any muscle, but we have like the iliac um, glute fibers, which are actually the highest on the pelvis. They, get, they come up from like the actual pelvic bone and then down and into the, um, they actually connect into the TFL, the tensor fascia lata. And then we have the sacral connections, which are a little bit lower, and they're a little bit more deep, right? So they're actually a little bit more underneath the iliac fibers and they connect from the sacrum and then they get again down into that TFL. And then we have the coccygeal, got it right, said it right. Well, I always find it hard to mm-hmm. pronounce, um, which are the lowest and they actually connect into the bottom of the sacrum, which we call the coccyx and they connect down and actually they don't connect into the TFL as much. They actually connect into the femur itself. And when we look at these muscles, well, We've got, the, we've got the most superficial, which we mean when we say superficial, it's, like it's, the, it's out the most. It's the closest to someone outside, um, and that would be the, um, the iliac fibers. Then we've got the sacral fibers, which are a little bit deeper, and then we've got the lower coccygeal fibers, which are even deeper again. And they have different roles, right? They actually um, well, they have different roles in different types of extension. So all three of them fiber orientations can drive you into... Exp- well, let's just talk about what the glute does mainly. It does extension. So it drives the hip forward and over that over the leg. Think of it as when you are sprinting, when you make contact with the ground and then you take a hip as fast as possible over the leg to drive you up and forward. Well, that's what the that's the primary use of a glute. That's primarily what the glute glute does. And um, with that in mind, they they all have these slightly different angles that they work at. We have um, the glute um, medius then. So we have the medius, which is on the a bit more on the side 
of the glutes and it kind of you could break it down into a couple of di different divisions but mostly what this this muscle does is it actually abducts the leg out just a little bit more out to out to out back and then out to the side and then we have the minimus which is underneath the medius on the side again and it's even small it's even smaller and again this one ab abducts the leg so it takes the leg out to the side and actually slightly out in front as well Knowing, uh, I know that's a little bit the take in guys, like breaking down the glute and what type of movements and patterns they like, but that reveals a lot of information to us. And it, if we know what pattern these, these muscle groups will get involved in, we know how to match an exercise to stimulate it. So knowing that pattern or knowing how, how they fire and what angles and what type of load and actions they do, we can pick movements to match them and then bring the best qualities and the stimulus of that muscle group to life so we can make it bigger, we can make it stronger, whatever it happens to be. So that's important content. Again, when we stick around later into, the, later into the podcast, we'll go into like three of our favorites. And into this, if you look in the show notes, I'll give you a spoiler now, we'll have a couple of movements in there that you can check out and you can start practicing yourself at home, at the gym, wherever it happens to be. Three of our favorite booty builders. So check it out. And, and with that in mind as well, like when we talk about all these different ways of training the glutes, then if you want to build like a functional like well adapted program that you've got to take into all these things into consideration to some level and then it even comes down to these kind of like where everyone should be doing these kind of variations of different movements for the glutes well then if you're looking at these kind of like uh your body competitors um your body what do you call them I forgot. bodybuilders mm -hmm. god um if you're looking at your bodybuilders well they can actually like they can actually stimulate certain parts of the glutes that they when they look at themselves quite lean they can go well i need to fill this part of my glute out well there might be a specific exercise that would be best orientated to fit in that part of the glute out and and we can also use it as just like as for function as well i think one thing that we didn't touch on that much which i think is really important where we kind of talk about how the whole body works together is how the feet Mm. Um, coordinate themselves um, with the pelvis well it's so important to look at right like sometimes a problem in this industry is looking at things through a very small lens when the body is an integrated system a connected system we talked fascial connections that run from a big toe up to our skull and across the body and wrap around and do lots of fun stuff we have connective tissue that joins muscle groups together but anyway what i'm painting this picture of is if we want to see the body move one of the best ways to look at it is how someone moves through gait through walking that foot and how that loads and transfers weight over it, that talks to how the rest of the shin and the thigh starts to move and what actions it makes. As that starts to make actions, that also dictates how the pelvis is going to make different shapes. And as we said, that beautiful booty is wrapped around that pelvis. So how the foot is positioned, where its load is, how much force and what type of force is going into that foot is going to help influence the shape of the pelvis. And the shape of the pelvis will then help dictate to how that glute's going to work and function. So know that how we position that foot, where that load is, how we're loading, is going to dictate again the shin, the thigh, and then the, and then the pelvis itself. And that can help us develop what we're exactly after, the, the glutes. And I think there's a reason why there's so many labels on the glutes not working. And it's pretty much with what Mitch just said, is that the issue is, is that you do have to take up this kind of whole body position to really get the most like, engagement out of your glutes. For example, like Mitch said, that when you land and you load through the middle of your foot, that sends up the chain. We kind of get these something happening through the shin, through the thigh. And when I load through the middle of my foot, that's where I'm actually going to get the most stretch through my glutes. To then, I push forward when my glutes engage from that stretch into your toe-off. So we have that kind of mid-stance into toe-off as I go forward. And as the hip drives me forward, there's something that I want to connect. I want to get my first met head, which is the pad just underneath the big toe. Anyone that's trained a benchmark has probably heard a coach tell them to use that or get pressure through it. And then as I push through that, I'm going to want the only way I'm going to really get that pressure through that first met head is going to be for my toes to get out of the way. And we find a lot of people don't have enough toe extension to actually be able to get that production of force through the first met head to then cue the hip to drive forward afterwards. So it all comes down to can I load, stretch the glute, so then I can push forward and contract the glute. And while there are really important things outside on a field or sprinting and running um, um, in track, they're also extremely useful t tools in the gym or like even for physios and whatnot to actually help people be able to find their glutes when they are supposedly lazy, inactive, and all them words. Well, really, it's just that you probably just don't have the body shapes to get the most out of your glutes. And dude, best thing is we can influence these uh, positions. 
learning how to like slowly break down, how to place the foot, how to place the pelvis, something I didn't say earlier too, the trunk and the head, if we can position that right, you, the glute has to work. It has to be at a lengthened position. There's a cool one right for you, right? Like a lengthened position. What the hell does that mean? So when that muscle is at a full like stretch, when it can fully elongate, it has a greater potential to start to contract and load, which is a big thing which we'll talk about in a minute too, is some exercises that force the glute to be in a very short position. It's hard to get the maximal force and load out of a muscle that's already orientated in a shorter position. Because when we load and contract, we're asking it to shorten even further. I can't go into where I already am, if that makes sense. So learning how to lengthen that glute at its greatest potential by moving the pelvis, the foot, the trunk, and all that great stuff, I can lengthen that and I can make that booty load through its full range, which is money. And that's gonna give you that stimulus that you're after. And over time, that trains muscles to be more more centered, more neutral. If you um, if you don't mind me using the word, more neutral. And a neutral muscle then can stretch and then get the equal opposite contraction on on the other side. And with that said, like when you admire muscles, their muscle like when you look at someone and go, wow, he's got big muscles. Their muscles don't normally look as big when they are short. So the shorter a muscle, the more contracted it is. Actually, normally looks actually smaller to the um, to the eye. When I have like, if you, there's a really good photo of like Arnold, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was one of the greatest like bodybuilders and obviously really good at posing. Well, he shows off his chest and his chest was probably the most mm. impressive part of his body. Well, he flares his rib cage out to show his chest. He doesn't actually squeeze his chest. And that shows these ginormous pec muscles. It's the same thing with the glutes. We're gonna look like we have smaller glutes when they're short and tight. But if we can get them to be utilized, the pelvis shape to change, to get our butt to wrap around them, them to be reasonably more lengthened, not all the way lengthened, because a too lengthened glute won't contract. It has to be like somewhere in the middle. Um, so it has movement through the, to, through the either end. But if we can get the pelvis to be in a certain shape, get them shapes throughout the body, we will look like we have a bigger butt, just like that. Like that can be like the quickest fix. Probably why Benchmark has a really good reputation for building butts. Dude, you train here for three months. You do at least three sessions, two lower body sessions. Like, I can't say guarantee, but you're going to get a booty. It's going to happen. Don't say guarantee. <laughs> okay, okay, money back guarantee. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I put it out there. I put it out there. But like, yeah. Just it's, make it one year. <laughs> it's positional, dude. It's, it's positional. And, and some of the stuff, like, again, we talked about, like, shifting weight left and right. Can I get weight into one hip and out into the other? Like um, a, a very common training term is like frontal movements. Like those type of movements are good for teaching those sorts of stuff, like moving left and right. Just what is a frontal movement? Frontal movements. Yeah, I guess uh, shifting left and right, like moving yep. out to the side and back in. So those movements are kind of match that are generally what you're looking at. And then another one, like kind of think that, but like let's think like now one leg stationary and the other side of the pelvis is wrapping and rotating towards it. So a big thing about the pelvis and the glutes, you don't, it's not, the glutes don't move together. We can move them separately and, and the one side of the pelvis can stay stationary-ish while the other side rotates towards it. Now being able to rotate into one side of our hip or thigh is huge for lengthening the glutes. That's forcing the booty to take a longer stretch and it's providing more load into one side, which is gonna give a greater stimulus. So we've got being able to shift left and right, and then being able to rotate and lengthen into that side at the same time. Two huge qualities, if you can practice that in your own training, you're gonna get a massive stimulus out of that. Yeah, exactly, and that's that, that's that reciprocal alternating movement. That's one glute is actually shortening to put length into the other glute by turning through the pelvis, which is like, like um, too much training is, um, Mitch mentioned frontal training, well, too much training in the gym, still to this day, even though it's becoming more mainstream, I think, and more popular to train different planes, too much training is that bi bi bilateral symmetrical, which is very often very sagittal, which just means that we do these movements like that kind of look front back plane, which is like a squat, a deadlift, all these exercises. And not enough training is done in that kind of side to side plane, in mm. the frontal plane, yeah, which doesn't have to actually be me moving side to side as much as just challenging that plane by being like more on a single leg or a split stance, like one leg forward, one leg back. And then again, not enough training is done in this, um, in this uh, transverse plane, which is incorporating that rotation. And if we, if we have a muscle that stretches around the body, right? Well, it would just only gonna make sense to pump them out as much as physically possi possible um, in exercises and all the different planes. Yeah, it's interesting that because I think if you were to ask anyone, hey, what are the three top glute exercises? I think all three, would be a squat, deadlift, and a hip thrust. All are bilateral fixed movements, not doing anything that they were talking about, not doing that functional movement of lengthening glute on one side, like we've been saying. So I think that's really interesting that those have become the three most popular. We'll get into the ones that we think are the most popular later. But 
I find that interesting that that would be the common trend of what is the best glute exercise. I think you're 100% right, mate. I think that is on the money. If you just go random gym, bro, how do you build your glutes? It'd probably be the top three. Um, no. Yep, off that, perfect mm. yep, segue, segue is actually talking about the, um, the, how you're going to train the glutes, what kind of methods you're going to use, and not just about exercises. That's the, have a deep dive into, like, obviously, the no- normal training principles we talk about all the time, but then what specifically do we want to do differently or what do we want to do the same when we train the glutes? I think it's uh, first thing is priority. You might be like, all right, I don't really care. All right, this doesn't apply to you. That's cool. <laughs> but if you're like, hey, I want to, I actually want to integrate some more booty work, and I want to get learn a few of these skills. Well, let's let's start thinking about what our training program is, and where can we make some subtle changes to start getting a bit more benefit. So first thing to look like uh, to think about is, does this apply to you? If you're a powerlifter, it doesn't need to really reciprocally uh, alternate. You just need to be gorilla that can lift weight. Cool. Let's move on. But if you're looking to try and get a bit more movement option at the pelvis, or you want to build a thicker, stronger backside, man, a lot of these basic training principles remain the same. And we, with, oh, sorry, sorry, Mitch. Shoot, with that, the specificity, like Mitch is saying there, is also like, are you training your glutes? There's so many different reasons to train your glutes. As we said, they get blamed for everything, and there's good reason for that. Well, you might be trying to build that booty, yeah, to be as big as possible, or you might actually be building it for function. It may be that you have been told that you have these lazy glutes and all these, I quote mark that, mm-hmm. and all, all these symptoms. Well, what, what the better, better way to do is to unlazy them glutes and actually get them like functioning appropriately with what we've just said just quickly before going to training principles like how freaking often have you heard that from a health practitioner not anyone in particular but it's been coaching what 10 years james i think you're on like 20 years and callan you're getting some experience with this how many it's probably more popular maybe i think maybe like 10 years or five years ago ish we get so many clients that come back from a health practitioner just going I've got my glutes don't work and I have to do these banded drills. I know we've already talked about it again, but it's still quite mainstream to use this as a blaming tool. Yeah, and I also I also think as well as that is that when the glutes are blamed and they're saying, hey, we need to strengthen the glutes, they always give, the, I, I personally think most of the time, not always, not at all, but um, they, I definitely think they give the wrong exercise selection very often. Yeah, I think it's always interesting because a hip bridge or it's a banded knee turnout or it's even abduction away from the body, which... If yeah, there's better exercise to selection the, definitely. The lens of gait of how we walk is the second most important thing we do as human beings. Respiration being the one before it. So all our biomechanics adhere to these two principles because they are the most used principles we use as human beings to be able to breathe because we need that right, and then be able to walk to go get food and water. It is total sense that our biomechanic adaptions go to around these two things. And to ignore those two major principles when looking at uh, treatment. Dysfunction. Yeah, dysfunction, treatment, and things of that nature is uh, it's just silly. And it just ends up, we're just chasing our tails. We're chasing our glutes, right? Because they're inactive, and they're never going to be active again if we, go, if we don't use these two lenses of respiration and uh, of gait. Chasing our glutes, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where are they? But, um, yeah, just, just a point to make. And it's, it's, if that's happened to you, it's, hopefully you can have that question in your head, like, okay, I'm starting to get some tools and starting to understand maybe a better way I can start to load the backside and get more function and movement out of my pelvis, out of my hips. Anyway, small rant. And, um, yeah, it was a good rant, Mitch. Thank you, good one. Um, on the side of that, it was, um, you, so you have your specificity, like, is, it, is this something that you want to chase? And also, like, is it how much do you want to chase it? Is, is glutes your main focus, or is glutes something that you just want a part of your training program? And then the other really important principle of training is progressive overload, which we bang on a lot about. Whatever I'm doing, I'm going to make sure that I overload it um, and progressively overload it. So put it to a position where it has to adapt and then give it more work to do so it has to adapt again and again and again. To That's get why you need to track, dude. Yep. There you go. Yeah, bang on about all the time and people have to pay it off. It's the best thing to know. If you know what you've done and your program calls for you to have the same session or a similar session for the next time, just got to slightly beat it. And you have to have some sort of understanding. Unless you have a computer brain that's absolutely amazing and you never forget anything, praise to you because you are God tier. <laughs> but um, yeah, tracking is a massive one. And if you just slowly beat your tracking, dude, that's one of the best things you can just possibly do to become a better human being in a gym sense. Um, other 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 things like volume, frequency, intensity, like that all falls under the umbrella of progressive overload as well. Like uh, rep ranges, planning different rep ranges, higher volume, you probably move move less weight. Lower volume, we're going to start to pick up some heavier things. How many times are we actually hitting these muscle groups is a big one as well. 
different positions. We met. We talked earlier about the biomechanics of like shortened positions, moderate positions, and lengthened positions of the butt. Trying to hit them in all three type of efforts is is another thing to consider. Not massive, but like if you really want to dive into the weeds, that that can be quite helpful. Um, progressive overload, massive, and getting some weight on it. You got to actually get some tension on the thing. You've got to load it up and challenge it. Like we use um, something called reps in reserve. Like what's our perceived effort for additional reps? And you got to challenge this, man. If you're like doing like a set of ten, and you're like you could do ten more, that's probably not enough mechanical load to drive adaptations. We have to take things into dark places. Once we can move well and we have good understanding, we've built up to it. Into dark places where things are goddamn challenging and we're stressing the system to adapt. And yes, there's a learning curve first. Yes, we build up to it, but that's the target to get into that type of stimulus at the end end point. Um, totally. I mean, even sometimes when it, you, if, if you are starting off, then you might just have to find the exercise that is a little bit simpler for you to start in the right mm -hmm. position. And then you can still progressively overload and you can still work to a high intensity. It just may be that it's not rep based and maybe, it, maybe it's um, maybe more time based. Back into that kind of like just getting into that kind of like working the glute for its kind of like full range of motion. Well, there's no really, there's not very few exercises that challenge any muscle really through their full range of motion evenly. So if we're looking at challenging a glute, and we'll go specifically for the, um, the glute um, max, well, actually, you want to try and take that muscle for its full length into full shortened range in an exercise, right? And if you can't do that, then you might have multiple exercises where you can go more shortened range, more moderate range, and then it's more lengthened phase. And there is no one true exercise for nearly any muscle that is perfect, right? So most of the time, we have to break it up into bits, especially if we're going to progressive overload. At first, your progressive overload might be very small. So you might not actually have to do that much work with your glutes to get some stimulus. Well, over time, this is where we have to maybe do one exercise or two exercises on the glute in a session, maybe even three, and then maybe we need to even challenge it where we go short, medium, long, which I love that as a, as a superset concept or a tricep concept um, where I do an exercise that is focusing on that kind of like more short position then I go into an exercise that's more medium position more long and if I did two exercises back to back that both focused on the short I would be burnt out mm -hmm. and we call that like a bunch of junk volume so like most of the volume that I did would actually be useless because I was too fatigued to use a decent weight but when I split these up because I hit the different muscle fibers I can actually do a ton of volume without getting that same fatigue but getting the response through the muscle really well and just getting back into that glute max well this is a big mistake that people make. We talk about, we spoke quite a bit about putting length into the glutes and um, putting um, the glutes into this kind of alternating movement. Well, when we look at the anatomy of glutes, often people talk about it as like, what does the glute do? Okay, well, we said it extends. Yeah, I told you that earlier. It takes the hip forward over the leg. Well, what else does it do? Well, it abducts the leg. So it takes the leg slightly away from underneath the body. Yeah, and then what else does it do? Well, it turns the leg outwards. It externally rotates the leg. Well, if I want to make this muscle work as much as possible, that is actually not the most important thing to know. The most important thing to know is where do I put that muscle on the biggest stretch? Yep, so then what do I need to do? Well, I need to do the opposite of extension. I need to flex my legs. I need to take the leg up across my body. Well, I need to do the opposite of abduction. So I need to take the leg slightly across my body into more midline, the middle of my body, and then I need a bit of internal rotation. So that's where I need the pressure through the inside of my foot. So if I can get exercises where I can take the muscle into that full stretch and then take it out into the full um, contraction, these are the exercises that are wins, big wins, and um, they're the exercises that are going to drive your glutes massively into the, in the right direction. And then it's just looking at the different muscle fibers, like we discussed earlier, the different parts of the glute to then put them in different positions to orientate them. Yeah, and I think when you explain it like that in terms of doing the opposite of what the glute does, and because we're talking about it on one side and you're talking about bringing one leg close to the midline, bringing one leg into internal rotation, I think that makes it really easy to see why those bilateral symmetrical movements aren't always amazing for the glutes and why those unilateral ones can be a lot more functional and get that stretch that you're after to get that maximal contraction. It, uh, exactly, Callan. Like, And with that, you also look at sometimes the the people trying to get their glutes more involved in exercises where they can't. And we can look at that like quite often in a squat. Or when I'm going down in a squat and you see this knee cave on the way up, well, what that can be is that's me trying to put pressure through the inside of my foot, turn my shin in, turn my knee in. It's not the most um, ideal way of doing it sometimes, but the best, the best in the world do it, and they are very good at doing it, right? And what they're actually doing there is they're putting themselves in positions where they can stretch that glute maximally in the squat and then drive the hip forward. So they're... 
They weren't able to get enough stretch through the position on the way down and then they drive up. And then we can look at um, other exercises which kind of don't put the glute through a big enough stretch and we just search for a stimulus. And stimulus, I say this all the time, but like stimulus is just not what you should be always searching for. There wants to be some reason under your stimulus because stimulus can be so misleading and so wrong. Um, so when we're looking at, for example, sumo squats. Well, sumo squats is a rubbish exercise for your glutes. Right? Mm. We're looking at... Um, Brett Contreras made this one very famous. Frog yeah, pumps. You got it. Frog <clears throat> pumps, which is literally just I'm putting my glute into the most contracted position, then going up and down, and I'm just so contracted that I can't get the stretch to get the contraction. You think like this. Uh, hopefully this will work. Um, ah, camera's off. It doesn't matter. Audio's still on. Um, so think of like this. If my hand's up, and I put my, my, my pinkies together and my thumbs together, my thumb's the back of my pelvis, and my pinkies are the front of my pelvis. If I let go of my pinkies and I pull my, my, my ring finger, or what's my, my index finger together, that's pulling the pelvis back, and that's making all those muscles really short and compressing the back of the pelvis all together. And that front of the pelvis starts to lengthen and open up to kind of squeeze the back of it. So what are we doing? We're shortening all those muscles, and they're all starting to get already in that, that shortened, contracted position. And like we said earlier, man, if it's already short and it's hard to shorten it even further. So it kind of goes against, it becomes like what James said, stimulus and sensation driven rather than lengthening it through a range, providing stimulus through the whole goddamn thing. So it, it doesn't really make sense. It kind of looks cool and it feels like it's hitting it, but it's not doing what the job needs to do. So I don't know, I'll put that in more of the rubbish tier of exercises. Yeah, and sadly it's not training the glute for its functionality. And if we have these inactive glutes, um, all these little things that again we, 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 and we hear labelled on glutes, well most of the time the issue with that is actually that the glutes are already too short. So they're already too, too tight, they're on a pelvis that is too far forward. And so, it's on a pelvis that is in toe-off. It's on a pelvis that is already pushing off the ground. So the idea is, is that we want to drag you back to get the stretch, find that, find that mid-stance, um, which is going to involve exercises that put more of a stretch on the glutes than tightening. And we find that some of the most popular exercises are literally just driving people into the position they're already in and maybe, which could be the worst possible thing, actually pushing them further in the position they don't want to go when they need to bring their pelvis back, take that shape change up that Mitch just explained and get the stretch through the glutes to then be to drive forward again. And if you're um, Mitch talking about being a creep, <laughs> well, when you do watch people stand in day to day, when you're grabbing a coffee, next time you watch someone stand, most of the time they are not standing very upright. They are leaning forward. Their weight is already too forward. That is someone whose glutes are going to be tight. That is someone who you're going to pretty look at and you're going to go, Oh, this person doesn't have the biggest glutes. Well, he doesn't have big glutes because they're very contracted, very tight, and very pushing forward, right? So what do you want to do? You want to bring that person back. You want to take the bowl shape of the pelvis and push it into the glutes so the glutes have to stretch, which just allows you to load them to then create a potential energy to then push you back and, and forward. And that's why, like, when you look at certain exercises, the stimulus may be very, very high because you're literally burning the muscle out. And the stimulus is high also because when the muscle lengthens, it gets more blood supply. So you lengthen a muscle, you get blood supply, more energy to work. Well, if I shorten a muscle, no blood supply can get into that muscle anymore. So you fatigue faster and you have this sensation that feels like, oh, I'm working really hard, but really the truth is you're using your anatomy and your physiology against yourself to get the most gains. I've never seen anyone get a big butt from frog palms. And I'd say probably you'd have to do three, four, five sets a week of 30, 40, 50 reps, four um, tons of work to get even a small modicum of increase, which you could just get for some decent bent knee RDLs or um, other exercises that I'm not going to mention, yeah. because we'll talk about that in a bit. Yeah, it's interesting that concept that while you may think what you're doing is really hard and really good for your glutes because it sucks, it fatigues, you burn the next morning, it doesn't always mean you're using them in the best way. Yeah, which is, uh, yeah, which is just comes down to functionality. So we really want to make things as functional as possible, and normally that does lead the best way to the best growth, and the best, like, kind of looking... Um, Postures and positions. Um, should we move into uh, exercise selection? Yeah, I think that's what everyone's waiting for, isn't it? Yeah, yeah is it? Like, so choices of exercises. So you have your um, well, you have um, your kind of like your big bang for your buck, big <coughs> exercises. And remember, like we're just talking about frog pumps. Well, with these smaller exercises, one of the other issues with them is it's going to be body weight, and it's always going to be a band. It's going to be very low resistance in the direction that you want to train the glutes. And what's going to happen is you can't overload that muscle as much as it might be. It's the stimulus. You can't actually put some decent weight on it. We, want, we do want exercises sometimes that are smaller muscle groups, smaller movements, 
but also we want to find exercises that we can truly put a lot of load on them, right? That's why your big, like your, your big exercises, your big compound exercises are really good glute builders. But you can also have additional exercises on the side that help increase movements that maybe you haven't been taking up. Maybe you are a power lifter and you always do everything front, back, up, down. Well, just to improve functionality and reduce risk of injury, you might add in some additional movements that are actually going to help you move better in general, which is going to keep you training forward in the future without getting injuries, right? Um, we look at like the kickback, for example, which is, a, I think, might be one of the most famous um, yeah, it's exercises. Out there, isn't it? yeah. yeah, but it's, it's an accessory exercise, definitely. This is not something, this is not your bread and butter. This is not your main movement. But we can use a kickback definitely to target different specific areas of the glute. And again, like I said, if the glute maximus is we want to work the top, the iliac fibers of the glutes, then I actually want to turn my leg out into external rotation and a little bit and back into extension, a little bit more off to the side. Then if I want to work my more um, sacral glute fibers, the more, the more um, a little bit deeper, not so superficial as the iliac, then I'm going to go just like a little bit turn out and as far back as I can. And then if I want to work the coccygeal muscles, I'm actually going to turn my foot um, into external rotation, turn it out, and I'm going to take it slightly back and towards me from an out, more outside position. Then, with that in mind, like we want to work minimus and uh, medius, well, medius, I'm actually going to take more into a completely side position, like that frontal plane that Mitch was talking about. I'm going to take it completely out to the side, and if I want to work the minimus, I'm going to take it a little bit more out in front. Discussing that, that's the reason that people love banded monster walks mm -hmm. because they are very much minimus, which is not much maximus, the big glue, not much medius, the second biggest glue, and the very smallest glue. And again, another reason why they get a mad fatigue in that area is because, of, A, it's a smaller muscle. You don't need much resistance to get it. If you did that with the glutes, they probably last a lot. They would last a lot longer. B, um, it's very concentric, it's very small, the muscles are shortening, they can't get much blood flow, they, wear, they will fatigue earlier. Yep. So just bear in mind with stuff like that. Other exercises that we, um, we, we love is uh, like the, the bent knee RDL, which when we're looking at a regular RDL, we put all the stretch through the hamstring because we are straightening out, keeping our knee straight, and we're bending through the hip. So that puts all the stretch through the hamstring. But when I actually allow my knee to bend, which is an extremely important thing that's needed to get my glutes to stretch because as I bend my knee, I put that weight through the middle of the foot. That's the beginning of the glute stretch ready to go to toe off. So when I'm doing a bent knee RDL, I put my weight through the middle of my foot and send my bum back and keep the knees bent. Well, my hamstring is now at even length. It doesn't change length much. And now my glute puts all the load into it. Yep. So the, like, that's two good changes, like change of your straight knee RDLs to your bent knee RDLs. Um, Get rid of your banded monster walks unless you really want your minimus, that very upper side. And I think sometimes you look at butts, um, and yeah, I've seen many butts in my time. And um, <laughs> you look at butts who've trained and they've done too many. They, banded monster walks, they still have a place, right? You could, people will want to train like their minimus, medius muscles. They still have a place. I just, again, I wouldn't make it my bread and butter. And sometimes people overtrain it so much that you actually see this kind of like, they have these bulges on the outside underneath their, their just underneath the top of their pelvis, and then they have nothing behind. So they actually kind of have a bit of a funny butt shape, and they actually just need to then probably drop the banded monster walks for a while and take it to some um, actual glute extension drills and flexion drills. All right. Um, this is pretty interesting to go into. And Callan, this will be your domain. So a lot of stuff, we talked Brett Contreras earlier, and, and reason to bring him up again, because he's been a big pioneer in the fitness industry for just isolating, making the glutes kind of this sexy muscle group that, that we hit. And like, hey, great job on that, but I don't necessarily agree with his execution of it, but it's a muscle group that deserves a bit of love. But a lot of the studies he uses is what's called EMG to kind of validate, he, um, to validate the training methods he uses. I'll get Callan here to kind of break down a little bit like what EMG is, some of its benefits and some, some of its um, maybe drawbacks and pay attention to that sort of stuff because it then kind of question why some of the movers were selected with this bloke. Yeah, yeah, that's a good intro to it. So EMG, quite simply, stands for electromyogram. So I think a really easy way to understand that is just breaking down the word itself. So electro, looking at electric. Myo is in relation to muscle and gram is just measurement. So it's essentially measuring the amount of electricity in the muscle. So pretty much what that's looking at is it's measuring how much your muscle is responding to a stimulus 
by tracking that electrical activity of the nerves that is fired when you activate that muscle. So the higher the muscle activation, the higher the electrical activity, which is those nerves to turn on the muscles. So this can be really good. So it's really quick, it's easy to apply. Uh, the, there are ones that just go on the skin as opposed to the ones that are actually those deep tissue needle ones that actually have to get stuck into the skin. Ugh. Yeah, they're disgusting. Um, and those multi-channel ones, so you can have a couple different electrodes placed around the body, they can allow us to see if a specific muscle is what we call bottlenecking. So that's looking at multiple muscles to see if one of those specific muscles is limiting the performance output. And that's where we might do those small exercises like those monster walks. If something is limiting your ability to do a movement, you can target that smaller muscle based off of that EMG. So that, that's a pretty cool thing that you can get from that. Um, also, there are really good EMGs that show muscle activity over time. So if you get someone to do a specific movement and you can track their EMG, you can see how much muscle activation there is at different points in the movement. And that can be really interesting to see if it's too early, too soon, if it's at the right time. Like, and you can compare that not only from person to person, but in between an athlete and himself as well, him or herself, sorry. And it does have certain drawbacks as well. So one of the main ones is that when you're looking at EMGs, there's no standard electrode placements. So other... Um, other measurements of measuring, such as like body composition, like skin folds, there's a really specific criteria that you have to fulfill and all of these people have to get qualified and follow the same procedures. And even then, there is still some intra-rate of variability. But this is no standard placement, so it can be really unreliable in between the testers and, uh, sorry, in between the testers, like doing it pre and post, and also just between different people doing it as well. So that uh, detection area that they choose to put it on, they say, hey, I'm going to put this AMG here, I'm going to put this electrode here, that isn't always indicative of the whole muscle. So if we're looking at the glutes and we're going to decide where we're going to put it, that could be on different regions. Like we were talking about, there's so many different regions of the glutes. There's those three different areas. Some of them are harder to access with an AMG than others because that's more superficial or more deep. So that can be a bit of a drawback using that AMG like that we're going to look in these studies in a second. Uh, they're also based on this percentage of uh, maximal voluntary isometric contraction. So when you're looking at an EMG, it's often going to tell you how active the muscle is based off of testing an isometric contraction before and say, hey, do this maximally in this certain position and we're going to see what 100% you can put out and then we'll compare that later to different movements. So looking at that testing in a certain position can be quite interesting because that might not always be the most powerful position, it might not be the most functional, it might not even be related to the movement that's going to be done later. So looking at that, in terms of EMG on glute activation, so you've got to keep in mind that there are those individual variances in people's glute attachments and what their glutes look like because everyone has different looking glutes. And one, one, of the, one of the cool benefits of doing an isometric contraction is actually the potential of isometric contraction is far greater. So isometric is when you pause a contraction, when you're in a stuck position, you're, you're trying to overcome something. Um, and when you, when you do an isometric contraction, it gives you some time to build up tension in that position. But it also, you can create up to like 150 more plus, like the amount of tension you can create in a concentric. And um, with the research, like... Callum was, uh, was look, has been looking through quite a bit of research with this, and there's actually tons of different um, isometric contraction positions that different studies have done. Can you give them a few maybe examples of different positions they worked on? Yeah, yeah. Like we were looking at this study. It was actually a big meta-analysis. So it had, I think it was something like 18 different studies looking at different glutes things. And we were looking at through some of the different positions. So if we're looking at the normalization method, so we're looking at someone did a standing glute squeeze, someone did a prone position with knee 90 degrees of flexion. There's a couple of those knee 90 degree flexion that reoccur, prone position with straight legs. And then one of them even has an extended and flexed knee position with a slightly outward rotated leg and hyperextended position. So even me just rattling some of the, these off, that was only four of the 18 different studies. You can see how much variability there already is in between them as well. So those positions that you're doing, those maximal isometric contractions in, they can always be different. And that's why we're looking at this with a bit of caution when we're looking at how effective this is at saying how active your glute is in different positions. And um, another interesting thing about muscles is they, different muscles have different force length um, uh, outputs. So what can, what can be is that one muscle actually isn't that strong when it's super concentric, so super shortened. Some muscles are stronger when they're really shortened. And then again, some muscles are actually stronger in their more lengthened positions. And then some people, some muscles have more of a moderate, um, most strength output position. So some of them exercises 
that Canon just um, mentioned, well, some of them are actually in this very, very, very short concentric position. Actually, not when the glute has its most potential power. Yeah, exactly. So that might not be the most accurate measure of, hey, is this actually your maximal voluntary isometric? So just looking at that, I have actually compiled a list of what they think, based off of these 18 studies, the maximal, vice, uh, maximal voluntary isometric contraction are for the top 10 glute exercises. And I was wondering, in your experience, guys, how accurately can you guys guess what those exercises are going to be? All 10? Oh, t- let's go five. Can you get the top five? Top five? Yeah, what would you put as your number one percentage where your glute is going to be turned on during an exercise? I'm not going to lie, I saw the list. Yeah, same oh, here, man. I, I, remember, I remember when, I wish I, I was going to keep it on the deal. Like, step up. Oh, you're, got it. <laughs> you're, too, you're too clever. Pretend like you'd never seen it before. What's your logic? Why would the step up be the most? One sec, but I can't remember outside of that. Well, there you go. Good. Like, I can only remember step up. Yeah. I can't well, remember the others. Who cares about the rest? That's the most not really, not going to lie. So, James was sitting so, there trying to memorize yeah. them earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, with, like, the step up, like, we kind of literally, we, we talked on the step up pretty much. Like, if I've got my leg up in flexion, when I have a leg up, well, that's, the op- that's where the glute puts length into. Then if I have the, again, if I have that foot up, it's going to actually, that's where it's a little bit more internally rotated at 90 degrees of hip flexion. So I pretty much get them two points where I'm actually put a nice, decent stretch on my glutes. You probably could get more stretch for the glutes, but another point on uh, these studies uh, that Cannon's gone through is their specific, very kind of like arbitrary exercises, right, that are determined, well, if we, I think with what we know more these days about biomechanics, you could specifically push people into positions where you know you're going to get more. So actually a step up with a slight forward and this is an interesting information on studies on glutes in walking and running, is actually the, gl- the glute maximus actually becomes quite o- um, engaged in uphill walking, right? So that any time we kind of lent into an exercise more and driving into it, we're going to get way more um, glute engagement. So you could doctor a step up. And with the step up, which was number one, right? Um, by a mile as well. By, yeah, yeah so this had it at 169% of your maximal voluntary contraction, which again goes to show that you're not always in your most powerful position in that testing because you can be super maximal yeah. when you test the actual positions themselves. 100, yeah, 100%. Some uh, sort of a hip thrust or RDL? Oh, you're close. Uh, hex bar deadlift. Hex bar oh, deadlift comes oh, in. Oh, you did remember. Two. You did hex bar deadlift number yeah, two. Yeah, hex bar deadlift comes in at number two with hip thrust and all other variations of hip thrust coming in at number three. All other, all variations. other variations. Yeah, That's so you've got your American bar, hip thrust, all that kind of thing. Ah, right. All bilateral, bilateral symmetrical movements. So that's one, two, and three. That Number is. four, I want to like, um, I want to say, is it, was it front squat? No, front that squat was, was quite down. low down the yeah. list. No, it was back squat. Was it back squat? It was a belt squat. Belt squat. Yeah, oh, you, say, you know, you see those machines. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great bit of kid. Yep. Yeah, and like again, like a, a cool thing about bell squat is you can you can put the load around your center of mass where you can be extremely strong. So I'd say actually probably um, with a bell squat, what's really interesting about it is the amount of force and the amount of load you can put for it. Like you can actually sometimes there's, we have these uh, biomechanically efficient exercises and inefficient exercises, and they can, they can both be um, very advantageous for us to manipulate um, muscles working and forces working when we're doing them. And I'd say a belt squat is something that's super biomechanically. Um, Efficient, yeah. like you can load that baby up, and you oh, can I wish I had one in my gym. Wow. Yeah. What What was number five? Number five comes in a split squat. Yeah, right. Yeah. See, I I think that you could manipulate a squat. I'd say you could manipulate a split squat to be higher up. In yeah, hundred percent. Hundred percent. Again, like this split squat's probably like bilateral, very bilateral, um, very bilateral. Obviously, not symmetrical, mm-hmm. but front back, and they're probably not taking advantage of what we can do from the glutes. So, in, and in the gym, we do it a lot. Like we get people to rotate slightly into the front leg. Um, as they go down, then out at the top, and simple things like getting that foot a little bit more to midline can make a split squat like super lethal for the glutes. And again, like a, a, a good split squat for the glutes would be a lean-in split squat as well. And yeah, I yeah, think exactly. they did they have some options or stuff. Yeah, like that? yeah. Like I was going to touch on that later in terms of like limitations of this. But um, before we move on, you're probably wondering where, where where's my back squat? Parallel parallel back squat came in at number nine. At yeah. 56% of your maximal voluntary contraction. So that's saying it's almost a third of a, st- uh, of a step up. So it's quite interesting that. But again, take that with a grain of salt as I go into the limitations of but this first, study. One big thing, right, is that the step up is a unilateral exercise. And that's why it's like, how much more was, it, how much more was a step up to number two? Uh, it was about, let's have a look. So step up was one. Then you had lateral step up, diagonal step up, crossover step up. 
and hex bar deadlift was 88 percent so half so step up Shit. yeah so and like by these country are, mile or just like we can look at that as like unilateral exercise in a sense isn't it like that is a true there's a moment where you're truly on one leg yeah. during, during a step up but then you've got your kind of split squat which is you are actually like a staggered stance two legs so that kind of unilateral for the win is any other unilateral exercises in there Oh, or, in, or maybe just not many unilateral exercises tested. They weren't there, no. The top four, all step-ups. Then we got a deadlift, hip thrust, hip thrust, belt squats. Blitz squat was the next one that came in at a unilateral exercise. I think a, a really important point as well to look at when we are trying to really fatigue a muscle or really actually or create a ton of tension in that muscle then stability is really important right you see lots of these glute exercises where they, what they do is they take stability out of the equation by like wobble boards and stuff like that well that may tune some neurological stuff in, in play but it's not going to be very useful for actually training a muscle to its full potential because we want the stability of the exercise. That's why when it comes to single leg exercises, the step up is a very stable single leg exercise that you can put some real weight on it. Mm. Well, where other, some other single leg exercises just aren't as stable, therefore they will reduce the amount of recruitment and muscular contraction you can take. So it's going back to what we're talking about is programming for glutes. Like we've got to have a mixture. We've got to, we want the high reps. There's nothing wrong with high reps as long as it's probably not too high and we're not, it depends what the specificity of it. But challenging muscles like to their greatest strength levels is a really big player and we spoke about this in, in our strength training um, podcast then you it allows you to target different muscular fibers and type 2 muscular fibers which are more triggered from heavy weight have a bigger potential for growth than type 1 muscle fibers which are more triggered from high reps so i think well, a big mistake people make with the glutes is just not going heavy enough if you've made it this long well done. I'm going to give you a hack. I'm going to give you a, a cheat. You don't even have to train for this bigger butt. I'm going to give you like, you know, get ready, get ready, because this is you can do this instantly. So what you got to do here, you're going to start to tip your pit hips forward. You're going to start to push your bum backwards. And as you push your bum backwards, you're going to start to lift your chest up and extend. Now you're in what we call an anterior pelvic tilt. That pelvis is down to four four, and the chest is up. Now you have now created the illusion of a bigger butt, and that ass is looking double the size. You have done nothing but push your bum back and start to extend your chest. Now you're ready for pitches. Now you're ready for Instagram. And you, you don't even have to train. How good is that? But the point here is you can fake that ass. You can fake that butt by just poor positioning, right? So that pelvis, like we said earlier, can move in a 360 um, dimensions. It can, it can make a lot of shapes. And one of the shapes that's very, very common is what we call this, like uh, interior pelvic tilt, for lack of a better word at the moment, just paints a good picture, that pelvis wanting to fall forward. And if that pelvis wants to fall forward, what will end up happening is that, that the back musculature will go, oh, no, you don't, I'm going to start to pull you upright. And now the chest is lifted up, the ass is pushed back, and it looks like you've got a pair of um, peaches behind you. But guess what? You don't. It's just the pelvis pushing back and kind of faking that position. So it's a very common thing you see just with, with human positions. But that, again, it's a, it's a fake butt. And when we talk about that coordination of the muscle, well, that's going to that's gonna mess up the coordination of the muscle because the low back's already on. Therefore, we're not going to get the, um, the, the glutes and the hamstrings involved in the right sequencing to get the best out of the glutes. And while you can't be scared of like a, a, the reason Mitch didn't want to use the anterior pelvic tilt word is that we are all naturally already in some anterior pelvic tilt. And it's not the biggest deal as long as we don't excessively co um, extend for our, our low back. It's just going to switch certain muscles off. And a lot of actually putting the stretch in the glutes, again, is that slight anterior pelvic tilt to get the load in the glutes and then the opposite to get that contraction in the glutes so there is a certain amount we want but we just don't want too much and i think it's pretty famous on um like modeling and like instagram mm -hmm. where you see people stand to the size and just like arch it arch it arch it but two two reasons why they do that is one it's going to make the bum look further out the in cloves it's going to make it look bigger and then in and two it's actually going to put a stretch on the glutes which again we talk about stretched glutes do look bigger right it's the other one I want to touch on, and I know you're going to have fun with this, James, is squeezing the butt in positions. This is like some kind of like, ah, man, just get it out. Don't do it. So like, I, still a lot of coaches kind of cue this, and it's like in squats or deadlifts. We get someone that's coming from another training system. It's probably one of the first things you kind of see is like, it looks like their, their pants are eating, eating their butt. And it's at the top of like a squat or a deadlift where they're just shoving that pelvis forward and squeezing the hell out of it, and the pants are just eating it up. There's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that just ain't happening here that you think are happening. Again, you we're creating this sens sensation driven action versus actually loading the position. Yeah, and like we can look at mind muscle connection for that. Well, mind muscle connection is it, it's in the hierarchy of what's going to grow muscle, but it's actually very low down the hierarchy. So it's actually not super important. Um, but it, like 
if you're getting really well trained and you've been training for a while, then it's something that you can ad- definitely additionally add on. Now, with the butt squeeze, like there is times where a butt squeeze wouldn't hurt. Like where actually when I'm putting in the more lengthened part of the bit and um, part of the movement, like in my deep hinge, in my deep squat, actually engaging on my glutes with a bit of my muscle connection could be really handy. handy. But the issue arises when people come to, most often it's when we see people at the top of a deadlift, the top of a squat, the top of a lunge, where they carry it on with the glute. A, there is no load in that position anyway. When we're loading a deadlift, the load is in the middle to the bottom. That's the, that's the most load. As I come to the top, there's no longer a moment arm on your butt with the load. Like for, so think of a back squat, for example. I have a barbell directly above my... Um, a back squat's probably not the best example because it was... Uh, <laughs> Um, it wasn't high on the thing, but we use a back squat anyway because it's easy. A barbell on my back, and I'm standing completely upright. Well, for there to be a load on my glutes, yep, it's uh, um, proportionate to how far away the weight is actually from my glutes to create a moment arm, which makes my glutes have to work. Well, at the top, there's zero. So there's actually no point in squeezing my glutes. The glutes are not working in the top of the squat. I'm sorry. As I go down into the middle and into the bottom, now if you look at the line between the weight and the butt, now this line is very big. That's where the glutes are working the most. And in a heavy squat where you're actually challenging yourself, probably the actual idea of thinking about your butt is kind of probably take you away from what you actually have to do by pushing the ground away as hard as possible. So I think if you can squeeze your butt, you're probably not using heavy enough weight and you could be just doing a heavier weight. And squeezing the butt, is, but the, butt at the top of deadlifts, squats, is actually just um, kind of a pointless endeavor. It's actually putting you into the wrong position at the top that is going to get your glutes to work if they are working at all. I think we've already talked about some of these other myths like glute activation and lazy glutes and that sort of stuff. And we touched on a little bit. I think it's very popular. Like, uh, this massive influence has been going on in Australia, right? A lot of these programs are, like, targeted to young ladies about building backsides. And it's all these body weight banded drills. And, again, just, like, a bit of a red flag. If it can't be properly progressively overloaded with weight, and we already talked about some of these positions, why it doesn't actually do what it does. Like, if you want to build a, a backside, I'm not saying it's a bad thing whatsoever, or if you're targeting that audience, happy days, at least do a better service with it. Yeah. Make it make it proper. Make it adhere to bi- biomechanics. Yeah, that'd be great. Exactly. A, I'd make sure I'm choosing the right exercises that actually work well as accessory exercises, mm. which aren't your monster band walks, which aren't your, um, what they called frog pumps. Like, there's better exercise selection. We kind of ran through a few of the accessory ones. Um, B, I'd make sure that if I'm doing high volume, that I can't get 30 reps with more than three reps in the tank, right? So if I'm failing at 27, I could only do two more. Well, actually, that's not that high volume. You're still going to get some uh, stimulus out of it. And C, that's not your bread and potatoes. Bread and potatoes? Not your potato. What, what's that? What's that? <laughs> it's not your bread and butter. Yeah, bread and potatoes. <laughs> it's not your bread and butter. Yeah, it's not your meat and potatoes. Meat and potatoes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, bread and potatoes sandwich. Mm. Um, so it's not your bread and butter and it's not your meat and potatoes, right? It's the, the, the big exercises where you can truly load it up and get some decent weight on it, like some of the exercises that we've mentioned today, are going to be way better for your actual main movements. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you do definitely. It's um, it's easier to sell to people, sadly. Yeah, and it's very like we said earlier, sensation driven, right? You can feel it, and like not everyone's meant to know this stuff, or everyone's that interested into it. And you're like, oh, I can feel it. It must yeah. work, and that's just that first barrier. Like, oh, it must must be good, <sighs> dude. It's hard. You got to dig like one or two layers deeper, which is effort and time, and people don't have that to learn how to lose, lose, and learn their glutes. Digging the one or sorry, Mitch, the digging the one or two levels deeper. It's like it, it, it creates an easy entry level. But the thing is, like, find yourself a def- decent coach. If you actually care about growing a butt, like they, they maybe stop buying all the quick ebooks and actually find yourself a coach who can actually run you through a, a good program and, and help you grow them glutes. Oh, shit. Then you're training with Brett Contreras. <laughs> oh, God damn it. Go to America. <laughs> train with Brett Contreras. <laughs> oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, guys, like I said, we'll, do you want to talk about the movements now or just want to leave that as links that the guys can check Should out? We leave the exercises as. Um, yeah, do check out those links below. Yeah, yeah, leave it. Don't let them know. Build that booty. Um, anything else, boys? No. Thanks for sticking with us, guys. May your butter grow large and strong. <laughs> Thanks, guys. See Thanks you guys, boy.